sure I'm going to mute you too. Okay, so we've got everybody muted. All right, um, we'll go ahead and start. Welcome. Um, would you advance the slide? Trying. Stand by. <laughs> okay. Um, this bird chat, we have, we'll start with announcements and then go over some mystery birds or one bird, I believe, and then talk about bird migration, new arrivals and departures. And then the program is eBird by Kathy Rigling, Susan Thumb Barrett, and Sam Mitchum. Next. And the next bird chat will be next week, next Thursday night. Um, and we have not settled on the topic yet, but um, it'll all be posted on Facebook. And feel free to share your birding stories and submit photos to info at orangeaudubonfl.org. Next. And Orange Audubon normally just has uh, monthly programs, the third Thursday. And that one coming up is a film Cultivating the Wild, Bartram's Travels. And it was gonna be presented by Robert Wilson that many of you around here know. He's a rep for Kawa Optics and a wonderful photographer and digiscoper with, with his Kawa scope, attaching the phone or camera to the scope. And so this is a lovely movie um, that was um, completed recently and we'll, you'll go to YouTube and put Orange Audubon Society in the search field to go to the OAS YouTube channel. And you might want to look at the program we had last Thursday, August 20th, um, on um, snail kites. That's, that's on the YouTube channel. Okay, and I want to let you know that um, Orange Audubon's new brochure is, is being worked on right now. We'll be to the printer in a couple of days and then send to you if you're on our mailing list. And if you're not and you like Orange Audubon and would like to join, you could just go to our website, which is orangeaudubonfl.org and find the join button and join directly through us. And then we'll, if you do it real soon, we'll actually have you on the mailing list and send you the brochure and other materials at the beginning of the year. Next. And I want to tell you that we have a new volunteer program to keep the Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive, which has become incredibly popular even before the COVID-19 shut down and then after it just in crazy popular to help the district manage it. We, we are there as volunteers passing out maps and giving some tips to first timers going through. And if you would like to join us on that, email volunteer at orangeaudubonfl.org. We'd love to have you. Next. Okay, <laughs> this mystery bird. See, um, see if anybody can figure it out. And we're putting it in the chat, is that right? Um, and Susan, can you see the chat? I can see the chat, yes. I know what it is, I know what it is. Right. Did you just put the answer in the chat? Yeah. Well, you went a little fast there. <laughs> Can All you right. Get back, Sam? Other guesses? Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is a, one of the rarest birds in Florida. I'll show you a distribution map in, in a minute. There. It's all at Lake Apopka. <laughs> this was I know who took the picture. I know who took the picture. <laughs> um, it was, there's only about 500 of them known to be in Florida. And, um, I, I had the pleasure of seeing this one with Sam, who took the pictures, and um, I, I, it makes me think that I've seen them many times and just not figured it out. Anybody? Snail kite, it, it, it is not. Anybody else have a, have a guess, Susan? I can guess, but I know. <laughs> okay, it, that's, that's not allowed then. All right, uh, Mac user, okay. All right. 
Okay, yes. Go to the next slide then, Sam, and show them the pictures. All right, now these are adults. The one that yeah. Sam photographed was a juvenile with more spotty underneath. But you got your dark morph and your light morph. I, I believe in Florida, the dark morph is more common. We've all seen the light morph over at Wetlands Park. And next slide shows the distribution and a little bit of information on them. So you see that they're so narrowly distributed. It's a tropical species and it, it breeds uncommonly in central Florida. Um, and it feeds mostly on small birds dropping from the sky to take them by surprise. So that's a big thrill when you get to see it. You just gotta look up and, Sam, do you wanna comment on, on what, what we thought when we saw it? And yeah, I mean, the interesting thing was we thought that it was, uh, first glance I was looking to the sun and thought it was just a turkey vulture. Uh, we weren't really paying attention. And then when we saw it turn, and actually that bird that was perched, I'm 90% positive it was the same bird Deborah and I saw, but I actually saw that later in the day, <clears throat> actually the next day on Sunday, uh, on the opposite end by the sod fields is where it landed. And uh, the same thing happened. I was looking into the sun, thought that it was a turkey vulture and then saw it slam into a treetop after a bird. And when it came out the other side closest to me, it was on that perch. And from the distance, I thought that it, the way it was flailing around, I thought it had a bird. But then when I got home and looked at the pictures, it didn't. And it actually left that perch, did the same thing, did one quick circle and then slammed into another tree. And I never saw it come out of there. So maybe it was successful on that one. Well, that fits with what I read that it's unlike other raptors, buteos that perch and look for the birds, it, 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 it soars and looks for them and then it stays hidden. So, yep, exactly. Um, by the way, um, on the 24th of September, we have a talk by um, Gina Kent from the Avian Research and Conservation Institute in Gainesville, the ones who monitor the swallowtail kites. But another one of their species that they work on are short-tail hawks, so she'll oh, very cool. give, give us some info. Awesome. All right, thanks, <laughs> and, and great spot again, Sam. Next one. Lucky. Okay, who, who's doing this one? Kathy? All right, so arrivals. <laughs> yeah, okay, these are two new birds that we're seeing a lot of recently. And just wondering if you guys can tell us what you're seeing here. What do you think these are? Jennifer okay. got one of them. Yeah. Jennifer, you want to unmute yourself and say what the one on the left is? I don't know if she heard me. Jennifer says it's a yellow warbler and that is correct. Uh, very oh, she correct. doesn't have a microphone, that's why, okay. All right, what about the right one? That one we're still thinking about. It's not a pine warbler. What do you guys think? It's got black stripes down the sides. Not a palm warbler. You guys are kind of close. Does bob its tail too. Uh-oh, did we stump you guys? No, there's some, the Mac user has oh, wait, it. Wait, Mac user's got one. Yep, prairie warbler, very good, very good. So these two birds are just coming in. Oh, it's Lori, hi Lori. So the yellow warblers are just starting. They're one of our earlier warblers. So are the prairie warblers to start coming in. They actually, the one of the easy reasons you can identify them is that plain face with that big black eye makes them real easy to identify. Um, the males will have some of those light chestnut streaks there on the breast. The females and immatures are a little bit, you know, lighter and duller. And does so anyone want to guess how old the oldest record of a female, or a, not a female, well, but it was a female, a yellow warbler is? How old the bird banders have tracked a bird like the oldest yellow warbler? What do you guys think? Eight years? Go higher. Ten, pretty close. 
So 11 years, they found one that was 11 years from when they first banded it. So I think that's pretty interesting. Um, they do pass through. We're going to take a look at the map. The other one is the, per this is the yellow warbler. Um, we see yellow warblers only during migration, twice a year. There is, if you notice, there's a little purple that says year round. There is a population that does stay in um, year round on the islands there. Um, and they and there's kind that of- that little population in the Everglades of yellow warblers. Yeah. So for yellow warblers, and then- the We have a lot of those in Idaho, by the way. Oh, okay. Now, yellow warblers are not considered, um, uh, as far as conservation, they're not anything in considered, but the prairie warblers are on the decline. As you can see, they breed in eastern U.S. They migrate a little bit through just the north part of our state, and non-breeding is in the southern, so we'll be able to see them for a little bit longer than the yellow warblers. They do have, they do do tail wagging and they have the black stripes. They are found in scrubby fields and forests. They are not found on the prairie despite their name. So who wants to guess the oldest known warbler, prairie warbler that they found the banders? What do you think? 12? A little bit lower than that one. This one's not quite as long lived as the yellows. So it was seven years and nine months. All right. All right. How do they? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> we can address the common prairie. Like, oh, that's okay. Deborah, do you want to do this? How they differ from the palm and the pine? No. We <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the palm warblers, they, they wag their tails they much wag their tails. more. Their behavior, you can just, they're always wagging their tails. And, and when they're in breeding plumage, they have like a, the males have a rusty cap. And, and for the most part, they're not here yet. And they'll stay much longer here in Florida. Until and the pine warblers, go home. you're bound. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Out in Idaho, do you have some of these palm warblers? No. Uh -huh, that's an eastern species, maybe. We do get uh, the uh, yellow rumped, and we get the uh, uh, Nashville. And there's a couple of others that we see commonly besides the yellow warbler, but those are the ones that are mostly the variations of yellow. <clears throat> All right, is Jack on here? Yes. Yes, I am. All right, good. Susan, are you wrapped on the prairie? I'm, I'm wrapped, yep. All right. Um, anybody catch, uh, care to venture a guess as to what we're looking at now? You can type it in if you don't have a speaker. Oh, Cindy? says black necked stilt. Yay. So these guys um, are migrating. Uh, they are short noted for short migration paths, uh, Central America and Mexico. They do breed in our area uh, on the wildlife drive. There is what people have seen over a hundred of them. Yeah. Yeah. They, um, if you disturb them, they are yappy. <laughs> um, they yap and yap and yap. And when the wildlife drive first opened back up, I was one of the first ones through, and I immediately went, went way down to where they were. And I parked and got out, and I got my binoculars, and they were probably 80 yards away, way the heck back. Didn't even bother getting cameras out. And then like three or four of them took flight and came and yapped at me and my truck. 
and a long way away. And I'm just like, what, what are you doing? And then two weeks later, when you drive through, they're standing in the middle of the road looking at you like, really, we have to move? And it was just kind of funny how they get, get used to it. The, the babies are pretty cute. Um, and um, they're, they're really something, really long legs. I think, it, or did, is it the second longest legs in proportion to their body? Behind uh, flamingos? I think so. Um, and then the males typically will have a, 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 a very black back and the females uh, not so much, more brown. And the eyes in the right light can be very, very red. And uh, they're really a, a very striking bird. So most and of them are, are leaving now. And there's the thing about they're very territorial. You want to tell that in the breeding season? Yeah, yeah. They they um, they let you know. They 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 yap and yap and yap and and they and they'll come fly at you and dive bomb you. And um, I've had that happen. I've had that happen sitting in my vehicle. Uh, that they were crossing a road with, with the babies, and then they decided that you know. Um, to, to go on the offensive. Um, and then aren't there some that we think stay year round here? Yes. On the Christmas bird counts, we always find a, a very few. Yeah. And at the festival, uh, two years ago, we were all regularly finding them. Yeah. yeah. But that's rarities. Most of them are go have gone. Yeah, we have a really healthy population in the Great Basin here of the black neck stilt. They do a lot of breeding here, so it's they're a cool bird. Yeah. Yeah, and the babies look like a cotton ball on long legs. They're just completely white when they're first born, too. So. Yeah, and the, the, the pattern, the baby, um, the baby's back, the pattern is a really, I think, really pretty pattern. It almost looks like a like a digital camouflage that somebody would put on the back of a shirt or something. It's it's right. it's really interesting looking. Okay, thank you. I think you're ready for your eBird presentation. All right. Okay, so here we go. And I'm not muted. Okay, so welcome everyone. And um, this this presentation um, comes to us from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which you can go to the next slide. And um, so if, if you're interested in like if you're from somewhere else and you would like to know how you can share programs like this, you can contact the lab and you can become an ambassador um, and they will share materials with you. They have a lot, a lot of materials on all kinds of stuff. So that's their, their mission um, to interpret and conserve. There's biological diversity through research, education, citizen science focused on birds and they do a fantastic job. And um, I don't know if anyone else sitting in this uh, little Zoom meeting has ever been there, but if you get the opportunity, it's a great place to visit. There's so much to see there and beautiful woods too, sapsucker woods. Where is it? It's in um, Ithaca, New York, okay. which is in the Finger Lakes. I was fortunate to go there for like a three day workshop and it was, it was really quite a place. So Citizen science, this is a really, really cool uh, slide. So eBird is, is valuable in many, many ways. And I got started because of learning about how I could help birds through just reporting them. And if you look at this map, someone guess in the chat, um, what do those dots of light represent all over the world? What do you think those are? anybody. <laughs> I'll, I'll guess that they are uh, log eBird sighting. Yeah. And I see Paula put that too, their reports. So, and this slide is probably a few years old, so it's even more. And check out in the middle of the Pacific there. So people are eBirding from all over the world and it's created the biggest database of any citizen science project at, of all time. So it's really, really massive. And in citizen science, it's everyday people contributing to scientific research. 
and, 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 you know, well, we'll talk about, you know, when I first started, when most people first start, they're afraid of making mistakes and like, oh, I'm going to tell them something wrong is going to mess things up. No, they, they have certain, they have things put in place to kind of prevent that, but our, our data is valuable. Okay, you can go to the next one. So um, here are some of the labs, um, citizen science projects. Um, and you can put in the chat if you'd like, if you're doing any of these such as uh, Project Feeder Watch, Nest Watch, The Great Backyard Bird Count, Celebrate Urban Birds. Um, those are their main projects. And you can put that in the chat if you want. Um, and their projects are designed to identify, observe birds, collect data. Um, oh, okay, so Laura, you do The Great Backyard Bird Count, awesome. Um, enter data online, and you can also view and retrieve the data, which we're going to talk about. So it's, eBird is not just about giving data, but you also have a resource where you can do all kinds of research from just minor little things. You can go deep and do like, you know, major studies. So those are all things you can check out. Um, so why do it? Well, first of all, you're contributing data and it has helped in conservation efforts. I know there was places in California that they were able to prove that certain birds were visiting that were, you know, on the endangered list and they were able to get protections for those places based on the eBird report. So it is really valuable. Um, you're providing sightings to help fellow birders. I think most of you sitting in here are birders, so you, you know how valuable it is to see what's being seen, so you can go look for it. And it also will help, it'll keep your list. It'll keep it by region and year, so you can go back and look at um, what you've seen and what your, what your targets are, and we're gonna talk about that too, how you do that. All right, so now we're gonna switch over to Sam. Oh, okay. Um, so one of the coolest things on eBird and Cornell is that I use almost every day is All About Birds. Uh, it's a site that you can click on through their uh, link. Um, and this is just kind of a little animated thing where I did it before. But uh, when you click on it, I did this with uh, the indigo bunting versus the blue grosbeak, beak, which Kathy and I both have had trouble looking into the sun and identifying. Uh, incorrectly more than once, at least for myself. Um, so this is all about birds and it's just a free website through Cornell, but it lists all of this information, um, which is just, it's so helpful. And, you know, we all have all of our bird guides and books. I mean, at least the old schoolers do, but uh, doing this stuff online is so much easier. And then as you can see here, what I did is between the two species, you can click a similar species. And that is so helpful to be able to side by side compare and read. And a lot of times they tell you exactly what the differences are of the two birds. And you can see how similar some of these birds look. Um, and again, like right now out at the drive, we've got greater and lesser scalp, which forever for two months, we were all calling it lesser scalp. And then one of our really good birders decided, wait a minute, I think that's a greater. And so between them and the eBird reviewers, they decided, but what I did is I came home immediately and put in both species and compared the two and compared them to pictures I had and figured out that, yes, I've been calling it the wrong bird for two months. So it's a really cool portion of part of eBird that a lot of people, I don't know if a lot of people use it and I didn't for a long time. And then when I discovered it, and especially with the similar species, it just, to me, it's invaluable to learn and also to let you know that you've been calling something the wrong bird for two months. So, but uh, that's just one of the little aspects of eBird and this all about birds that you can click through Cornell. And it's, uh, to me, it's just super helpful. And I just started it over. There you go. So back to you, Kathy. Okay, back to me. So we know that we have people here that are at all different levels of um, looking at birds, enjoying birds, chasing birds. We're, we're, I'm sure we have a wide range. And um, so for people that um, maybe are new to birding or if you go to a new location, this Merlin app is one of the really easy ones to use. You know, I do enjoy my field guides, but 
out on the field, I don't want to track a whole bunch of stuff, especially here in Florida where it's like a million degrees. Um, I just want to carry my phone. So Merlin can be helpful. It's not an end all. It's not perfect, um, but it's great. So you can go ahead and switch. So you, it's a free app and it comes from the lab and you can get it for um, Apple or you can get it for Android. And what you want to do, um, oh, Cindy said, the birds get offended if we call them by the wrong name. Well, yeah. <laughs> so if you do get Merlin, what you want to do before you go out in the field, you want to make sure that you get, they have what's called bird packs that you need to download and you need to do it where you have internet because it does take a little while. You want to make sure it's set up for the region you're at. And what's really fun is with Orange Audubon, uh, we got to go to Puerto Rico right before the pandemic hit. And I downloaded the, the um, Caribbean bird pack. And so I was ready when I got over there and had all the birds up in there. So um, when you do, you can also you can play with this because you know we don't want to take a lot of time in, in case you don't need to know this, but you can play with it to set it to the season. So when you pull up Merlin, it's only going to show you what's most likely during the season you're at. But the only problem with that, if you get a bird that's out of season, it won't show it. So I just leave mine open to everything. And that's what I do, but you know, different people do different things, but it'll, it'll come up with what your most common birds that you will see um, at the certain time, if, if you set it by season. So I see there's a, uh, some questions. Oh, okay. So Paula has used them in Costa Rica and Egypt. And yes, yeah, sometimes we get birds that, that are, don't belong. We have that happen often, especially if we get, you know, hurricanes and things like that. Stuff comes from all over the place. And last year um, here in Florida, we got that mountain bluebird from, from out west. And so he definitely was not in our pack. So th those are always exciting, but it will help you on day-to-day -day identifying stuff. Okay, so. That's the I Idaho State bird, by the way. The oh, bluebird. is it? Oh, <laughs> We were so thrilled when that showed up. Yeah. That was so exciting and it stayed for a while. So many, many people got to see it. It was so beautiful. Yeah, it was great. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna show you, this is the desktop version um, way before they had the, the mobile app and eBirding on the mobile app is a lot easier in my opinion, because you just set it up. So, okay, back up eBird is different than Merlin. Merlin is for ID and eBird is for reporting what you're seeing. Even if you just see one thing, it's still a checklist. You know, um, some people say, well, I went out and I only saw a cardinal. Well, you know, report it because what's not there is also valuable information. Um, so you do have a mobile app, but there's also the desktop. Some people keep lists. And as long as you keep track of your time and you kind of have an idea of like how far you went, you come here to eBird.org and actually the very first thing you need to do, oh, okay, um, is you need to set up an account. And that is to be done on the, um, the website. And so you'll set up an account and use your name and then um, you can start reporting your birds. So you can go to the next slide. And they have a lot of tutorials. So you can take a little one hour class, it's free. And it goes through a lot of different stuff. So um, on the desktop, you'll have a, where you can pick what location you were at. And again, if you use it on your phone, it uses GPS and it finds, it gives you a list of locations and you can look on a map and see where you're at. Okay, you can do the next one. And then, you know, for all the checklists, it, you report whether you're traveling, you're walking or in a car or on a bike. Um, stationary, you're just, you know, you're like sitting out, looking out your window or incidental, you know, those are those times we're driving down the road and oh my gosh, we see something and we have to pull off really quick. And then you put in a checklist that way. And that kind of helps the, the, the scientists at the lab know like what effort went into what you're seeing. And I've never seen the other, that's different. <laughs> so, um, what, <laughs> once you, um, uh, once you, put in your location, it'll download a checklist of what is commonly seen at this time of year. And if you look at that, it kind of gives you a clue there. You can tell this is not Florida, <laughs> totally not Florida. Um, 
Yeah, we could get American black duck, but not not very often, and ringneck pheasant. But so you, you simply just put how many you've seen. You don't use tally marks um, because that they don't set it up that way. Looks like the Rocky Mountain uh, Flyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We common merganser. We'd love to see one of those, right, everybody? <laughs> yes. All right. So we can go to the next one. So the mobile is, you know, a lot easier and um, you just click start and, but you do need to have an account before you can set this up. And um, it has some nice little features. You can go to the next slide and see what it shows. Yes, you enter numbers. And what, what happens, so for those of us from Central Florida and we go to this wonderful place called the Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive, which is open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we go in there and we're driving in our car and you're like, oh my gosh, there's like a million mer a common gallinus. I mean, yeah. So you like I count all of them. Well, what you do is you just estimate and it's, it's better to estimates instead of like just putting an X and you can kind of get an idea. Did I see 50? Did I see 200? And you know, when you first start out, it's I, you know, you're kind of like, mm, I'm scared to make a mistake. But if it's way off, we have these wonderful people called eBird reviewers and they'll email you and they'll, they'll ask you some questions and yeah. they don't get mad. And they know, you know, someone new, they know, they know it, you're trying and that's, that's what counts. Um, oh, Cindy saw three great horned owls on the loop trail. Oh, that's great. That is great. Yeah. So yeah, the, the loop trail Paula is one of the access points um, where you, you could hike in this time of year, not really recommended because there's no shade, but biking in is really nice. But later when it's nice out, yeah, it's a great place to go. And so, Lori, yeah, I see Lori has the question. Did about, you see the, about the X? Yes, I'm just going to address that. So okay. Sam and I were talking about this. So I, I was under the understanding if you put an X, like you didn't want to guess how many, you were just not sure that they didn't count your list. But Sam, you want to share what you were told by our eBird reviewer? Yeah, actually Paul Huber, who is a local god in the birding community, but also a eBird reviewer. Uh, I was with him this weekend and I thought to ask him because the X has always been a, a weird point of contention with a lot of birders. A lot of people do it, a lot of people don't do it. Uh, and when Kathy had mentioned that it cancels out your entire list, I, I asked him, I said, does it cancel out your whole list or just that species that you put the X in? And he said, actually, the X just counts as one, which I guess is okay for your list, but as far as the citizen science portion of it, it doesn't really help anybody if, you know, especially at like somewhere like Lake Apopka where there's easily between 400 and 1200 gallinules right now, if you put one, I don't know what it does to hurt the science, but obviously it's not helping it at all, I don't think. Um, so yeah, I, it's still up in the air, but Paul seems to think that if you put an X, they just mount, mark it as one. So again, it doesn't really help with the citizen science if there's 10,000 ducks and you put an X, just because you don't feel like dealing with it doesn't seem to help anybody out, I don't think. Yeah, and another thing eBird says, which helped me out when I first started out, it's you're listing everything that you can identify that you hear or see. So if you can't identify it, then don't worry about counting it, you know, or what you could do if, if you have a camera, you can try to get pictures and you can always change your list later if you are able to figure it out or get some help figured out. But um, so you don't, you know, if you see stuff like, especially if it's early in the morning and I was out earlier this morning and, and stuff is flying. I saw ducks flying over there and they weren't making any sound. I couldn't tell. So you do have options on certain species like ducks. Um, it's duck SP for species. So, you know, you knew it was a duck and you didn't know what else. You can do that or you can just leave it off. If you don't know what it is, you can't identify it. So and that's okay. So, um, so this is just a little showing you that all the citizen science projects with the Cornell lab have similar models, whether it's Project Feeder Watch, which we're not going to talk about, or um, Nest Watch. You are identifying things, you're collecting data, you're entering it, 
And then you can retrieve that data and you can view it online. And, oh yes, birding by ear, yes, totally. Most, you know, most birders, that's what we do. We, we hear a lot more than we see. Um, so, you know, and that's totally valid. If you know what that bird sound like, or we, there's even apps that help you identify it, then you can use it in your list. So I'm gonna turn it over to Susan, who's gonna talk about how you can use the website to explore the species and look for things that you wanna find. Okay, and I think one of the things we talked about is viewing your data. This is actually, I pre-recorded it, so it's not real. Some of the dates are a little bit older, but it's the same thing. So if you wanna to look to see your statistics, you go to My eBird. Um, it'll show you everything. This one just shows orange. You can change the region. Like I do bird up, my parents are in Ohio. I go up there, I can put in my Ohio stuff. It'll show me how many I have, how many checklists. I mean, I'm more interested in the species than checklists, but I can do that. Um, my, you know, your total numbers, the year, the month. But usually what I do is I go right to checklists. These are the ones that I put in on my phone. Um, and typically what I'm doing is I'm going over and I'm going to edit and put my pictures in. I like to take pictures. Um, so I do, if I'm able to take a good picture, maybe not even good, but I put in my pictures, I like to do that. And you would just go to this manage media and you would add or delete pictures this way. I'm gonna to have to say, I kept putting in piping plover when I went to the coast and I had to take it out like two times because my little pictures, those little legs were hard to see which ones were pink or which ones were gray. So then if you wanna take a look, so I'm at like 293, so I need about seven more birds to get 300. So I'm gonna kind of look at target species. Um, you can put in what region, I don't like to put in the US because I get an awful lot of Western stuff that I can't see anyway. So I will put in Florida for August. I can take a look here and see the different things that I need for my list. Now I do have some of these in Ohio. This is for the Florida list. Um, this is amazing that eBird does this. It takes your Yeah, so I can look at what I need. And of course I've seen hundreds of Canada gooses in Ohio, so I really am not that interested in driving to see one of those. So let's say a North, a rough wing swallow. So I can go to the map and of course I wanna put Orlando because I've really you know, if they're here close by, it's good to see. So I can see that August 17th, they were seen at Mead. It's a little bit older, so I always like to get the newest if I'm gonna go out and look for something specifically. Um, this is a little bit newer. I can go to his list, click on it. That also shows me things, other things that if I decide to go there to look for this bird, what I can see, like greater and lesser scalps. He, has a really good list all the time. So, um, and then I can check out and see that he did have the rough, rough wing swallow. And the other thing is that he saw 400 swallows. So it's like, ooh, my odds of maybe seeing that rough wing are pretty good. So I might want to go there. Let's say I don't know where this is. Like if I'm in up in Ohio, I can go up to that little icon that looks like a flag. And it's going to show me a map. I can just put in my home. I can get directions. Put in from home and it'll tell me how far away it is and how to get there. So I can say, okay. I want to know where this is. Especially when I was in Ohio, this was very helpful because I don't know where anything is up there. Um, so I can go back, let's say, ooh, swallows. I haven't looked at them in a while. I can't remember what it looks like. <laughs> Cause sometimes you just, if something you haven't seen a lot, it's like, oh yeah, it's that brown one. You can go back, click on the name and it'll take you to the page with the swallows. You can also get to the map from this page too. And Paula is asking if we can do this on the phone app. I know you can do the Explorer. They have a new, um, is it considered a separate app, I believe, called Explorer, where you can do the exploring part. Or if you go to the web, you can get all of this on the web. So this is, I just wanted to show that 
you can go to the same map through that picture. So eBird has a lot of things that interconnect. So you can go a lot of places different ways. So a lot of people have different ways they use it. I know Sam and I were talking and we have different ways that we're pulling things up, which makes it kind of interesting. Um, I think Cindy said she saw a rough wing swallow, but it had a large patch of white on the wing. I don't know if anybody, I don't know rough wings too well. This is if I'm looking for hot spots, I can pull up and see, let's say I'm looking for mead, something I can take a look at what people are seeing there. I can go down and check out the list. And I see that someone saw a northern water thrush. So water thrush are just starting to come here. I did try to go see these thrushes this morning and I couldn't find one, but I know another bird or Mary saw a Louisiana one, she said. So these are beautiful pictures. So that kind of gives you an idea of what you can see. So looking at somebody's list, what they can see, it gives you an idea of what's there. Um, Yellow-throated warblers. Very nice. So if we go up to the top, there's a little a thing that says the hotspot map. So let's say I want to look at things around me. Maybe I want to go to a couple different places. I can hit this hotspot map. And it pulls up all of the spots. Oops, I think I froze. Okay. Are you frozen, Susan? I think I froze. Can you hear me? I yeah. Can. Oh, okay. So this is just looking at the different hot spots. And if I wanted to see where they are, if I haven't been there, I can look those up too. And that just tells me how far away everything is. And so that kind of gives you a little idea of what you can see. Sometimes if you go to the hotspot map, you can just hover over the little icons for the different e-birding spots. If you're in an area and you can pick up things that are close by. It'll kind of tell you the name of the spot as you're hovering over it. Is this me? No, no, I think. Hang on. I think I'm slow. All right, and that's the end of that. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, yeah, this is me. So something else cool that you can do, um, and I'm looking at Paula's, uh, Oh, okay. That's a really good question. Paula asks, do you record sightings as you are out or tips on remembering? <laughs> so that's a really good question. I know there's people in our local community that can remember what they see. And they do it later. I'm, I'm not there. Um, so what I try to do, because you don't want to lose a moment. So if you're out and you've got a flock of warblers and they're just all over, you don't want to stop and be putting names in because you're going to miss something. So you kind of watch and enjoy, take pictures. And then when things calm down, then you go put it in. That's kind of what I do. Same with the wildlife drive, because usually I'm, well, now with COVID, I'm driving by myself. So, you know, I'll see some stuff. When I stop for a moment, I'll go enter in and try to estimate, okay, I saw about 50 common gallinus there. And then the next time I stop, I'll add more. And that's kind of what I do, um, is kind of do it as long the way. So I um, want to talk real quick about, 
you know, it's migration time is so exciting. And you can look at data for migration. So go ahead and um, they have all kinds, just if you want to go down a big wormhole, just go on eBird and you'll get lost. They even have quizzes with photos. It's fun. Just if you have time. All right, so you can go ahead and go to the next slide. And so we have two mystery maps. So we're going to show this is bird number one. This is a bird that is found in Florida for part of the year. So um, if you can watch, um, okay, I'm going to move this chat here so I can see. So it's showing you um, time of year and what the bird is doing. So there's May and June. We're in July and August and September, October, November. And all this data is from eBird, by the way. And they have these maps. If you go exploring, then you get that rainy day. This is fun to do. So I'm not going to have you, well, let's go ahead. You'd like to guess what this bird is. And you can just say it if you don't want to put it in the chat. And if you don't have a mic, you can just um, type it. So that first bird, what do you think that was? It's pretty common. It's pretty loud. <laughs> Big hint. <laughs> and sometimes we see a lot of them, but they're really loud. Anybody? Cardinal? No, no, they're bigger than a cardinal. Way bigger. Darker than a cardinal. Darker, yeah. <laughs> a lot beefier. No, no, you're going to see it flying in flocks. A crow, yes. Does anyone, any guess on Cindy's right? What kind of crow do you think it is? Ugly crow. <laughs> uh, fish crow? No, it's the other kind. So what's the other crow that we have in here? American crow, Juanita. Very good. So we're at that, that is the migration of the American crow. Now we're going to look at one that's a little bit more interesting, I think. So watch this one. And this one is getting ready to migrate like right now. They're starting to leave. Yep, and look where they go. It's a much smaller bird. And what's cool, when this bird leaves, another one takes its place in the habitat. So any guesses, it's much, much smaller, very fast flyer. And we're still seeing some, but we're not seeing a whole lot. We were seeing a lot before. Any guesses? It's a small bird. We see them on the wildlife drive especially towards the sod fields. Yes, a swallow. Any guesses on which swallow this one is? Not the tree. The tree is the swallow that's getting ready to come down and start. Yes, barn swallow, Paulo. Very good. So you can advance it. So this is fun. So those were our two mystery birds, the American crow and the barn swallow. And the barn swallow is leaving. Okay, so let's move on. The next one is going to be, all right, just to show you real quick, more things you can go on the website they have these nice bar charts and it shows you like you you pull up birds of your area and it shows you what time of year to expect to see them and if you look at this list any guess where this list is from can you guys tell i'm a teacher yeah <laughs> <laughs> any guesses it's not florida we would love to we would love to see some like a lewis's woodpecker and a Harris a Sparrow and a Golden Crown Sparrow, we'd love to see those, but they're not here. So, any guesses? Think about where the lab is. That's where this list is from. North, yes. Yes, he's in North. New York, yes, Paula. This is a New York list, so we're jealous. All right, moving on. All right, Sam's up. He's going to, we're almost done, and he's going to talk to you about how he explores eBird. Yeah, everybody does these different, and I learned, I did a very silly thing this year, and they, in Florida, we do a thing called the June Challenge, <laughs> which is a terrible, terrible waste of your time. No. Um, <laughs> basically, June's the worst month to bird here because it's so hot. Everything's, there's obviously at the end of migration, there's nothing really coming and going and it's just miserable to be outside. But basically you try to see how many birds you can see in a county uh, for the month of June. So as I started I, doing this, I was like, well, I'm gonna do, I live in Seminole County, but I'm gonna do Orange County because that's where the wildlife drive is. That's where <laughs> the majority of the good birding spots are. Uh, you know, I'm sure people in Seminole County would yell at me about that. But so anyway, what I do for me personally, which I discovered during this 
insane contest is I do exploring regions, which you can put in Orange, Florida. So that would bring up the whole county. And what I'm more, again, for the citizen science, I'm looking at recent visits and then I go through and I try to see a lot of times you know who most of these people are or you know of them or you see somebody's name all the time and you know that they get a good list. Um, but it's really important for me, I do it the night before, I also get up very early and I'll go through the, the day before's lists and see what everybody's saying. This one I clicked on Bob Sokola, he's great with warblers, he's always at Mead Gardens. So, and what, I don't know if it showed that because it's automated, but the first thing I do is scroll to the bottom where the warblers are. I don't care if he saw a, a turkey vulture or a black vulture. I want to know if he's got Cape May warblers or black poles or anything else. So I'll go through his list and look at it. And, but I basically go through and you can pull up every single spot and every list for Orange County. And then I can click on there knowing from the other avenues you explore, what birds you're missing, what birds are coming around. And it's basically like, scientific gossip you, you you know you talk to a lot of us text each other like oh i've got this here i've got this here but this is a really good way especially if people are putting in pictures and exact locations in these big parks like oh i was in mead gardens you know there's warbler corner which is on one corner of the property there's the boardwalk and there's the uh different trees and that kind of thing and the beehive and so you start to learn these places and if you're shy and afraid to talk to anybody, all you have to do is log on to eBird and you can find everything you need. So it's, uh, if you're still too scared or starting out and you're not used to it yet, it's a really good way to find out what everybody's seeing and where to go. You know, it's, you may think a place, there's a million places that I've been to that's like, oh, this place should be filled with birds and it's not. So you go on here and you find out if it's filled with birds or not, so. But that was my little tidbit just on the way I do it. So anyway. So Kathy. Or yes. Deb. Yes. All right. So we hope you enjoyed this and maybe learned one little tidbit to help you as you go explore birds and would like to encourage you to report the birds you're seeing because it really, really is valuable data. Um, and if you miss ID something or you know, when you're doing it on your phone, sometimes we have fat fingers and you click something wrong, like, you know, that doesn't belong here. Someone will let you know, and it's an easy fix and it's not a big deal. We all do it. This is fantastic. And maybe we could have a second session on this at a later date or, and then have the eBird reviewers talk sometime. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'm interested in how to do historical, data. Remember we were talking about that too, Sam? Yeah. Well, and I pulled up, we pulled up something the other day that it had a list. I think it was sightings and it was, the date started at 1900, which obviously isn't, I don't, maybe it is correct. I didn't go, but I mean, I didn't look that far, but I thought it was very interesting that that was the date range that came up was 1900 to 2020. So it'd be interesting to go back and look like, you know, back when Harry was doing like a popka and if those lists can be compiled and brought up that easy, it would be amazing. Yeah, I don't know if he's entered his. Um, Lorne Mallow, who uh, has lists from surveys that he did through the St. John's River Water Management D District, um, is putting them in now. He's got a thousand checklists in. Laura, you, you know him. That's gonna be valuable. Yeah, she's put in that, she's, she's inputted a lot of those lists. Oh, okay. From um, Harry. Oh, nice. Yeah. Great. Okay. Oh, someone did ask um, about Wakaiwa. We do monthly bird surveys, so we are having one on the 12th. So just, um, just send me an email or hang on after we close this chat and I can give you the details. And we're doing, we're using eBird when we do it too. <laughs> we do. Yeah, we do. That's very easy. Any other questions? Let's see, comments? Thank you guys, great job. 
I think like anybody that's on here that's beginning, I think, because I'm relatively new to all this, is don't be afraid to make a mistake. <clears throat> and don't be afraid to ask somebody a question if you're out. I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time you're running to super great people. And, you know, saying, you know, hey, I just, did you see that duck that just went over? Or, you know, I mean, we've all asked what you would call super silly questions, but everybody does it. And, you know, have fun. It's, there's so much knowledge and, and information out there that you can use. And, you know, just do it your way and have fun doing it. So. And Kathy, there's a question yeah, for I you saw about the sharing list. Yes. So <laughs> if you bird with somebody, um, as long as you both have an account with eBird, you can share your list. And we do that all the time when we go out socially distancing, but we go out in small groups, like, like the Wakiva survey, one of us will keep the list. And then when we're all done, we'll, we'll talk to each other and say, okay, how many of these do you think we had and like that. And then we can get your username and we can share the list. And so everyone gets the list and then you can go in later, you can add your own pictures and it's, it's a really nice thing to do. So thank you for asking that, Lori. All right. Thanks everyone, appreciate it.